I'm Madeline Blair, and this is Unlocked. You can't have a successful career without knowing how to deal with the unexpected, and Unlocked is here to help you do that. If you're a person who sets goals that challenge you to fully reach your potential, this show is for you. This is a show all about opening possibilities so that when you're hit with the unexpected, you have options from which to choose. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoy this episode of Unlocked. And if you do, make a comment in social media about what you learned and might do differently as a result. If you're on YouTube, click the like button. Um, better yet, subscribe. You can learn more about the show on my website, madelineblair.com slash unlocked TV. And it includes all the replays of earlier shows. And if you have a topic idea, or a question, just email me at madeline at madelineblair.com. And if you're curious about the background of this show, check out my book, Unlocked, Discover How to Embrace the Unexpected. It's available on Kindle, audio, and paperback. If you'd like to explore what it means to build and nurture your resilience with me, be sure to sign up for my mailing list on my website, madelineblair.com. I'll keep you informed about my new group mentoring program, that new group mentoring program called Unlocking Together. Our topic today is about relationships, creating long-term relationships. I've often talked about the value of social support to help you be resilient. The support gives you what I might call a rest when things feel stressful. It turns out that in a recent book by Robert Waldinger and Mark Schulz called The Good Life, they agree. They say the people who are, were happiest in their study, this is their research, the people who were happiest, who stayed healthiest as they grew old, and who lived longest were the people who had the warmest connections with other people. I love that word, warmest. I mean, it's not about careers or money. If you don't have people to help you deal with stresses that come along, the body stays in a low level of fight or flight mode. And that means that higher levels of circulating stress hormones and higher levels of inflammation and these are the things that gradually wear away many different body systems. So what does a long-term relationship look like? And how do you begin and maintain one? Well, as usual, Dr. Ed Huffman, former Chief Knowledge Officer of NASA, will be joining me on an exploration. The topic today is relationships. Let's join the conversation. And I have so enjoyed our conversations on relationship, but I think it might be useful for us to really hone in on relationships that really span amount of time. Now, NASA teams had projects for 30 years. Is it always the same people? Probably not, but I bet you there are people who were there all the time. And how do you make sure that the relationships that the team members have remain productive. Uh, there's also long-term relationships of uh, of simply a partner, even partner in business, or mm -hmm. uh, a lifetime partner. I mean, mm -hmm. so let's talk about that aspect of how do you really sustain that kind of good relationship? Well, you've done it. I'm gonna you and Gerald. So we should really start by how you do it. Um, but I, I'll I'll get to, you know one of the things I would say. Um, in terms of the work world, what I would say to NASA folks, you know, to be together for six months, a year, two years, even that you can work that under good or bad situations. But when you're doing these long duration things, many years, sometimes decades, then you have to be thoughtful. And I think uh, to me, I always think it starts with the human element. We've been talking about relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there has to be a foundation of respect and inviting people. People need to be heard. 
if I'm going to be on your team and you never listen to me, then eventually I'm leaving. I think their second needs to be uh, that ability to that we're growing. Um, uh, relationships are either getting better, they're either developing, they're, they're growing out, or if they're not, they're dying. And so in the organizational setting, uh, are we creating spaces where people are learning, where they're getting better, where what they're working on, they can take to other places. So there's growth. I think the third thing is, you know, I titled the book, The Smart Mission, right, that I work with Larry and, uh, and Matt. I think there's a commitment that we're doing something that matters. There's meaning, there's purpose. And out of that comes from this 110% commitment to the mission and to that dream that we're working on. And if we know it's going to be 30 years, then we're committed to that and we, we re, recalibrate that. So I think these are the things that, that matter. And I think then we, we establish processes of communication. We have to have a, a cadence where we're talking frequently enough. Uh, we have to have a way of how do we make decisions? It can't be Madeline's making all the decisions and Ed does the ones that don't matter. So these are, I think, the things. It's that, that sense of relationship, that sense of learning, developing, and growing in the relationship, that sense we're doing something so important that we want to commit 110% you know, to that mission, to that dream, and that we have our organization in place so that we're attending to communications, decision-making, and, uh, and a valued, uh, valued partnering of the work. You know, I want to thank you for that because you used the word meaning that part of that, <clears throat> that, of that relationship that fuels the ability to have a long-term one is that you're all working toward uh, a, a committed um, goal or something, whatever you want to call it, but it gives meaning. Now, I remember in our first discussion on on uh, relationships, I said something about, well, you know, it's a good relationship. If there's meaning to it. And I didn't even know what that yeah. meant at the time. Yeah. But I'm beginning to see what that means now, that there's something in the relationship that gives, gives us uh, a sense of purpose. That's I, I'm really excited that I finally figured out what I meant by that. You know, sometimes <laughs> they say things. we've got we've come back to the what was the quote? Uh, In the end, you'll find yourself at the beginning and yes, yeah, understanding like uh, yeah. better. Yeah, no, I think that's true. You brought up that notion meaning a while back. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it resonates. It's it's vital. If, if there's no meaning and you see this, you see this in relationships, you see this in organizations where. They're, they're just going in a place, but there's no sense of importance. And then there's a drifting apart and eventually you lose the core. So I think that that's vital. So let's come, let's, let's stay in the organization for a minute. Yeah. There are, there are things and you, you miss You mentioned that we need processes for people to be able to handle these kinds of things. I know when, when I have, worked with teams where we were doing a major project and maybe it took a for me a big project was a full year uh, i rarely did i take on projects that were longer than that well i have but <laughs> not on a contractual basis on a marriage basis well on a marriage basis <laughs> on, on career basis <laughs> career base yeah that's right yeah right yeah uh, in fact when I, I i remember when i was the first division chief at named a division chief at the world bank I knew it was going to take me five years to do what I wanted to do. And, and it did. Right. So, um, so I do longer, but, but contractually it would usually an, a year. And what I would do is really give the team a chance to quote, get to know each other. Yeah, not about, right. the, not about the work per se, but something that they bring to it. And, uh, I know it's it's part of building trust is getting to know who's on the team, but it also opened up the permission for them to talk about something other than the project. They could talk about other things. So that was one technique that I have used. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I think, uh, well, first of all, one of the things they, they used to laugh at me that I would always use the word fun. <laughs> we want fun. Or, you know, and they explained that in the old uh, Myers-Briggs personnel. Oh, Ed's, uh, Ed's personality type is about fun and everything. But, but I think that's very important. That's why gaming is so powerful as a tool, you know, that um, we try things out. We do simulations. We get a, a, addicted to these things because we're enjoying it. And I think partly a relationship has, that has to be fun there. I've always said I think the most powerful uh, ingredient I would always look for uh, would really be friendship. But mm. think about what, what a friend is. Uh, you have fun. I mean, with the right friendship, it's fun. Mm. You're supportive of each other. Uh, there's love there. There's a, But fun is so important that you, it keeps you alive as humans. You're you're dancing around, you're singing, your things are growing. And you I know, think that's part of work we forget is the fun. You know, it, this reminds me of someone who was on the show. I can't remember exactly when. Um, she was. She called herself a clown facilitator. You remember her, I'm sure. I know, yes. Yeah. And, and I, I remember she said, you know, you have to, it's always better to just give people the opportunity to laugh. Right. And allow to do crazy things because they feel so comfortable. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, how how can we, in a business setting, make, no, you say that differently. How can we open the possibilities that in a business setting, they are given permission to, right. to do unusual things and knowing that even after they do the unusual thing, they will be accepted in the group. Okay, well, I'm gonna leave you hanging right now, but we'll come back, don't worry. Uh, and I, I do wanna tell you that the person that we were, that I was trying to remember was Angie Wakeman, and the show is called Finding the Clown Within. Uh, if you check it out on my website, uh, you will have fun watching it. Well, but today, I want to get back to creating long-term relationships. And I want to introduce my wonderful guest. I've been so looking forward to this. LaFaris, welcome to Unlocked. Good morning. Again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> well, let me introduce you to our audience a little bit, and then we'll jump into our, our discussion. Uh, beginning with $50 in her pocket, she opened an in-home daycare center. And today, this is Living Arms Child Care and Preschool, the largest commercial childhood facility in her area. And today she has three additional entities, including Loving Arms University, MGB Real Estate Company, providing housing for domestic abuse survivors, and her personal brand, LaFaris Risby, who serves as a training and intellectual development company. All four are proud conglomerates of her multi-million dollar company, Loving Arm Enterprises. And I haven't even begun to talk about all the awards you have received, Lavaris. <laughs> but I remember the first time that we encountered one another on screen like this, and in fact, twice that way. And then we finally met face to face. Yes. It was as if we had known each other for days. Yes, it was. <laughs> so I, again, I just want to welcome you to Unlocked. I'm glad to be here. Glad to always spend time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, today is going to be, I think, a little different. But, you know, it's still February. And February is Friendship Month and, you know, Valentine's Day and that sort of thing. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on was that you always speak from the heart. So we're both going to be speaking from the heart today, I think. Uh, let's see. How, how should we begin? Uh, how would you like to begin, Lafaris? Maybe, maybe tell a little bit more about yourself so people get to know who you are and and what this thing, from your perspective, a long term relationship is. Well, um, like Madeline said, I got to Junction City, Kansas, with fifty dollars, no place to live. My biggest reason for coming was I was in a relationship with a, a, a abusive husband. And I decided that I needed to get out. So I said, by any means necessary. 
So I came to Kansas and I hadn't, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I needed to take care of my children and I knew I needed an income. Mm -hmm. And so I remember sitting at the table, writing down the things I was good at, the things I wasn't good at, you know, that whole gamma. And I came with childcare. And so then I said, okay, this is what I'll do because my children need a safe, loving environment. And I had to start bringing in some income. And over that span, I just realized how much I enjoy working with children and working with families yeah. and helping them grow and develop and learn. And most of all, help, it's about relationships. When you're working with children, it is strictly about relationships. Yes. I always tell myself they're not like a um, a place like a Foot Locker where they're on an assembly line or Amazon is on an assembly line. These are people that have natural emotions and their emotions change sometimes hourly, mm. but their emotions change. Not like an assembly line where you're doing the same thing every day. And I can tell people in my business, I've never had the same day ever. And so about <laughs> relationships, it's all about building that trust and that love. People know when you're genuine. People know when you really accept them. People know mm -hmm. when you really want to be in a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. I, I have to agree with you there. We, we sometimes um, think that we can't see it in another person. And yet... We're built to see it in other people because that's what keeps us alive and, and um, safe. It is. Yeah. Uh, now, I know eventually I want us to talk about our marriages because I think both of us have gotten to a place where we can say we have a long-term relationship that's been solid. But I want to also say, what are the what have you seen are the impediments to, uh, to really building a healthy relationship? Trust, understanding, and wanting to do it. Because if you you want you love and trust and wanting to be with a person, because when you want to truly be in a in a good healthy relationship, you got to want to do it. Because you're going to sacrifice some things. It's not going to always be easy. It's not going to always be what you want it to be. So you got to get past that. You got to love. Love is a key ingredient. It doesn't matter whether you're in a marriage. It doesn't matter whether you're at your office. You have to love what you do in order to bring relationships, even into your office, because you're still dealing with people. Wow. <laughs> I love the fact that you immediately brought in love, because indeed, the love really is not, uh, it's not the, uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, it's not the just the emotion. It's the decision that you're going to be willing to alter what you do in order to assist that person wherever they are. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's a different place. And in fact, my feeling is that's one of the reasons that uh, my husband and I have been together for so long. I mean, this year we're going to celebrate 50 years together. Oh my God. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> we look at each other and say, hasn't been 50 years, has it? <laughs> when you love someone, it seems like it's a, you're in a relationship for a lifetime. Yeah, But it feels like it was just yesterday because yesterday. you love them. You're having so much fun. Now, not to say you're not going to go through some trials and tribulations, but you're willing to stand with that person no matter what. That's right. And uh, and you also, part of what I've discovered is that, and I loved your word that you have to want to do it. I put down the word desire. You really have to desire this because it does take energy to accept the fact that the person is not doesn't clean up the dishes the way you would clean up dishes. Now, I know that sounds silly, but you know, it doesn't. <laughs> Thank it doesn't you. Because people, people leave out of relationships for the most simplest things. I'll just, I'll take washing the dishes. If that's something that really bothers you, then sit down and talk to your mate, sit down and talk to your significant other and say, look, mm -hmm. that really does bother me. And you'll believe it or not, because they love you. It may take a period of time for them to do it, but mm -hmm. they will do it because they love you and they want to see you happy. Yeah. And, you know, I think that even translates into the business world, because mm -hmm. if somebody comes into a meeting and always interrupts somebody, uh, interrupts other people in the meeting, well, you say, well, that's just normal kind of thing. Big, not a big deal, but it is a big deal when it silences certain members of the team. Because I remember as a division chief, I mean, I had a large staff and I had to make sure that sort of thing didn't happen. Now, they may not have ever said that it was love, but in fact, it was a desire to be an effective member of the of our division that was that was energizing that. And so I would take the people afterwards. I never did it in public, always afterwards. And I would say to them, 
when you do this, um, Jake doesn't have a chance to say what he wants to say because you always, and let me tell you, it didn't, it didn't take long for people to adjust. So, yeah. I always tell people relationships are the, are crucial, even in the business world. I really don't do business with people that I don't know, I don't like, and I don't trust. And I know, <laughs> I mean, because it's about everything for me is about relationships, um, repeated business because I work with children. And this is going to sound, it made me feel old, but it made me feel proud. A couple of weeks ago, a young lady that I did child care for, oh, she was about four. She's grown and off in college and needed a part-time job. Wow. And where did she come? She came to us. And it made me feel really good that I had installed that in her as a child, that wow. she felt like she could come back and work with us. And that tells me relationship building is so important. Wow, that is a remarkable story. I mean, a four-year-old, that's a long time ago. That's a long, long time ago. And when she came in, she looks the same as she did, just, you know, and got older and a little bit bigger. And I was like, oh my God, I feel, oh, Jesus, help me. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience just wow. to know that you made an impact on that's a family right. or impact in a young person's life because some we, we have these millennials and they are learning how to deal with relationships because they're in the age of, you know, computers and, and the texting. So they'd rather text, you know, and that's their way of building relationships. But I tell them I'm from an older generation and I'm not too into all that text. I want to see you. I want to see your face, get to know you, get to like you, get to trust you mm -hmm. because that's what's important to me. Yep. Yep. You know, Speaking of children, although I shouldn't say that as a, as a preamble, but anyway, I always ask teens to give me questions. And I say, you know, if, I, if you were sitting in my seat, what would you ask uh, my guest? And it's interesting, the, the, the question they, they ask, they actually have two questions. I think I'm going to ask the second one first. Who truly changed your life and what would you say to them? That's profound. Wow, that's profound, especially for for um, young. You know, we think about those things, but sometimes kids don't really think about that so much until they start getting older. Yeah. You know, we all have to grow, learn, and develop, and learn how to build relationships. They don't just happen. It's a it's a cause and effect. You have to. This is something you have to desire and have to want. Even with young, you know, young friendships. You know, people have been friends. You know, for three or four decades. But what made them stay friends? It had to be some commonality and it had to be the like and the trust that they built in that relationship. You know, some people are in a relationship longer than they would have been in a marriage. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but but let's come back to that question that the teens asked. Uh, who changed your life? And what would you say to them? Who was it? For me, it was my mother. It, it would be my mother because my mother died that I could live. And as I grew and learned that, um, I became aware of how valued a parent is, how valued a mother and father should be in your life. You know, they're not always going to say what you want to hear. But at the end of the day, they are going to do what they feel like is best for you. And I used to always ask myself, if my mother was here, I would ask her, how did you know what type of person I was going to be? And, you know, what did it feel like to know that you was going to die for another person to live? Yeah. Oh. Because I always, those are quick two questions that I always wanted to ask, you know, wanted to ask her if she still was here. And I've just settled in my mind that she would be proud of what I've done and accomplished because I think everything I do it relates back to a person or a thing. And I tell people that all the time, the decisions you make are ultimately for your tomorrow, right or wrong, good or bad. That's right. Your decision you make right now is going to propel you for the things you're going to do for the future. Mm -hmm. Whether it's being a wife, whether it's being a husband, whether it's being a mother, whether it's being a businesswoman, whether it's, you know, working as an employee on the job, everything goes back to that full circle of relationships. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It is it is so powerful what you're saying. Uh, uh, 
I really appreciate that. And and when you spoke of your mother, I I was thinking in my own mind, the person who changed my life was my mother too. I was very fortunate. She lived to 95. So oh, that's wonderful. I, it was it was absolutely superb. I mean, and, and, and anybody who's watched my show knows that I speak very highly of my mother because she was such a strong influence and always a loving influence because she wanted the, us to be. And she would always say to me, you can do anything you put your mind to, Madeline. And I didn't understand that until many, many years later. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've had some of that advice because um, yeah. sometimes you don't. Our older yeah. parents talked in riddles, you know, and I'm like, what does that mean? But as you grow older, you do realize what it means. I remember my father, the, I swear that's the best piece of advice that he ever gave me. And my father was a loving man. And I grew up with my father after my um, mother passed because they were, they stayed married. They were married for, I believe, 25 years before she passed. Mm -hmm. And my father told me the decisions you make today will ultimately, ultimately affect your tomorrow, right or wrong, go to bed. You affect every person that you come in contact with. Wow. And I'm thinking, what? Because I'm 15 at the time he's <laughs> giving me this advice. <laughs> I'm 15 and I'm thinking, okay. And you know, it went right up over my head. But by the time I was in my 20s, mm -hmm. oh my God, I, I understood it to mm -hmm. the fullest of the length of it. I, I truly understood what he was saying and how important and valuable it was going to be even in this stage of my life. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you have often spoken highly of your husband because I know you're in a long-term relationship with him. Now, you, this is obviously your second husband. Yes. What is it that makes him so valuable to you as a husband? I mean, I really want people to see what a long-term relation, a good long-term relationship means. To be honest, he loves me unconditionally with all my flaws, all the craziness I do, <laughs> all, <laughs> all the ups and downs, all the roller coasters I take him on. He's just, okay, baby. Okay. He, when he retired, he told me, he said, um, you helped me retire out of the military. Now I'm here. Your wish is my command. He said, I'll drive you anywhere in the world you want to go. Um, he says, I'm going to be Arthur. And I was like, who is it? He said, Arthur, on the show, I'll drive you anywhere you wish to go. <laughs> and so now when I travel, he's my traveling companion. He always goes with me. He, and, and when we're out, sometimes he doesn't go to the event. He'll be in the hotel. But the one thing I can say, he knows what I like. He's out looking a good place for us to eat a good place for us to go walking, a good place for us to be to spend time together, whether it's on the beach or whether it's somewhere watching a movie. He takes the time and do the things that I feel like I don't have time to do. Wow. But That's I'm very appreciative of him for that. Yeah. It, that's, it reflects that commitment and which we, we took, you know, we termed earlier, you've got to want to. And that's what that commitment is all about. As you're describing your husband, I'm thinking of mine and very much the, he, he supports me in what I do. And I do some crazy things, too. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not as crazy as you, Lavaris. <laughs> you know, I'll jump off. I'll jump off a cliff without a parachute and be praying. Help me, Jesus, all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would do that, <laughs> but I might do some other things. But indeed, there is that there is that support. And, and when I... I mentioned that that book in the beginning where they said that when you have this these warm relationships that you're healthier, you live longer, you're happier. And I thought and that by the way is from a research done by Harvard. It's one of the longest researches research programs they've had. In fact, it's still going on. It's wow. spanned like 75 years. It's a really wow. long one. And then they're discovering this, that it comes back to having really warm relationships. And um, it's, it's pretty hard to have a, a long-term relationship with us. So there's not some warmth <laughs> in it that feeds the heart. Ah, well, now you, you described what, what um, your husband does to maintain the relationship. To, what do you do for him? I remember one time I was, um, I was doing a lot of traveling. And he, this is before he retired and I was, you know, gone. And one day I was on my phone. I was just always, I was always doing something, could never be still, was always doing something. And he asked me a question. It was the beginning of a new year. And I said, what do you want from me this year? And you know what he told me? He said, I want you to be present. I said, huh? What? <laughs> what do that mean? Be present. 
He says, when we're spending time together, because we have date nights, which is every single Friday, rain, snow, doesn't matter. Even if he's not here, we would do it over the telephone because that that's what bonded us was those Friday nights. And so he said, I just need you to be present. And I asked him, what do that mean? He said, no phone. Yeah. You know, have your mind with me. Yeah. All these other things, just let it go. And so what I, what I decided to do was after five o'clock on Fridays, I'm done. Mm. I am absolutely done. Any, I don't answer emails. I don't answer business phone calls. People that know me know that already. If somebody passed away, I'm sorry. I love you, but there's nothing else I can do. You're not here anymore. So it doesn't matter if I talk to you on Friday or I do it on Monday. So, and he asked me that, and I've tried to be very, you know, very obedient to that as his wife, you know, being present when we, when we go out someplace, I'm not constantly on the phone. I'm not constantly stopping to have to stop and talk to somebody, you know, just, you know, when that time is our time. He said, he told me, you need that too. You need to be able to rejuvenate and be ready for Monday. If you're doing it all of Friday, all during the week, then all of Friday, all of Saturday, all of Sunday, when do you have time for you? For you. He said, so I want you to be present with me. It doesn't matter what we're doing. We can just be sitting up watching TV or we can be having dinner because he literally will not have dinner until I'm ready to have dinner. He wants us eating together. That's mm -hmm. he said his and his you know mother and father was together over 50 years. And he said that was the one thing that I saw my parents do together all the time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it was so odd because in my family, we all had breakfast together. Because my father worked at night and my mom worked in the day. So the only time everybody could get together was like the eight o'clock in the morning. And my father was like, I don't care if you got banging. I don't care if you got cheerleading. I don't care what you got going on. Track, it doesn't matter. Breakfast time, this family will eat breakfast together. Huh. And I think that did a lot for our family because that's how my parents, they that's how they kept up with my older uh, siblings. That's how my dad, when my mother died, me and my, my dad didn't do it as much. But I realized that's how... We kept up with our children. I had Sunday meetings with my children. That's how I kept up with what was going on throughout the week. Mm -hmm. What did they need me to be at? What did they need me to come to? All those things. That's how I kept that, that connection. And they used to hate those Sunday meetings. Oh, my God, they hated them. <laughs> but I now see them doing it. Yeah. And yeah. I see my grandchildren saying, man, when I get grown, I'm not doing no Sunday meetings. I'm not doing this. I'm And my, my son and daughter say, said the exact same thing. Now they're doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> ah, those simple rituals. Well, you know, you've worked providing child care. Um, how have you seen that service? What's the impact on the relationships of the parents? For me, I think they know they have a loving, safe, stable environment. Because as a woman, I know me. And I, I, I just, that was one of the reasons why I stopped my job. Because my, I remember my son crying and begging me, please don't leave me, mom. And I went to work and I could not concentrate. That was the day I quit my job. I just quit. Didn't know where I was going to work. Didn't know I, what I was going to do. But I knew I, he, he, I needed him to feel safe. I needed him to be secure. We had just went through a traumatic event in our lives. And I needed him to know I was going to be there. And so for me, that meant I needed to find something that I could be stable and help other parents. In the meanwhile, I sit back and I think about what COVID has done. COVID made people think about a lot of things. It made me think and how I was going to interact with some, with some of my clients that I actually coach. It made me give them questions like, if you got sick tomorrow, what would happen to your child? Do you have something set up? Do you have a wheel or a power of attorney? What happened to you? If you got sick and you mm -hmm. couldn't do your job, who is going to act on your behalf if you got sick and went to the hospital and you can't talk? Who's going to act on your behalf? All those things became full circle for me. And COVID, it, it, it did something for our society. For one, it made us stop. It made mm -hmm. us stop and think about our families and think about the things that was important to us. The second thing I, I wonder is, we, um, I did a research, uh, and I can't remember what what it was, where it was right now, but it said two to three million women have not went back to work because of COVID, and they can't find childcare because fifty percent of the child cares shut down. Either they couldn't, they couldn't stay open for whatever financial reason, or they, the children, or whatever, mm -hmm. or they were just so overwhelmed in their life till they just closed their doors. 
And so now we have a shortage and women will not work unless they know their kids are safe in a loving environment. They just will not. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be productive on anybody's job because mm -hmm. they're worried about their children. Mm -hmm. And I know that because I know how I am as a mother and my children are grown, but I know mm -hmm. how I was and how important that those relationships that they build in those early years, how important those, you know, I'm looking at people that's coming back, bringing their children back to our facility. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, I'm old. But <laughs> but it's it's wonderful because they could have chose to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's not like they that they had to choose to come to our facility. Mm -hmm. They could have chose any facility in the area. But it also makes me feel like that I've done something in this world. I put something into this world that I can feel really good about. Oh, and you should. You should. I, I, I know that was one of the biggest challenges I had was finding good child care while I was working when my daughter was young. Uh, it was it was it was hard. It was very hard. And I, I did a lot to, you know, to, um, you know, check out each each opportunity because there were no child care facilities. So I had to find an individual that I could learn to trust. In your business, I know you say that you don't do business with people you don't trust. How do you build that trust or how do you build that sense of trust when you have to work with a new partner, say? During COVID, you know, COVID, you couldn't meet with people face to face. And that's where Zoom came in. You can tell a lot about a person when you can physically see them and you physically interact with them because it's a feeling of, of, of a feeling that you get. Um, it's just like, if you call me, Madeline, and say, LaFerris, I need you to do this. Okay, Madeline, I got you. Because I've been in a relationship with you. I've, spoke, I've spoken to you. I've spent time with you. Mm -hmm. So it's all about, again, spending that time with that individual. Whether it's over Zoom or whether it's face-to-face. -face, you're spending time and you're getting to know that person. When you're getting ready to go into business with somebody, you're not just going to business. You're going to sit down. If you're doing a partnership, you're going to sit down and you're going to talk. You, you might even go out to dinner. You all sorts of things you may do to build that relationship to where you trust your partner and they trust you. Because if you don't trust your partner, you're not going to put your money in something that, oh, well, I think I know them. I think, no, it's going to be a certainty that you have some type of certainty in your spirit that you and that person have connected beyond just, hey, girl, how you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, that you've connected with that person. I like that phrase, time. It does take time to build the relationship. Uh, yes, it may turn out to be one that lasts forever or whatever, but you still have to invest that time in the beginning. Uh, speaking of time, what do you feel the benefits are that that you actually receive when you have a long-term relationship? Longevity. Longevity. Because when you have a long-lasting relationship, you build a bond. Not just with, with a person that you're married to. That's even in friendships. You build mm -hmm. a bond. It's longevity. You may have met this person in second grade. Now you're out of school, out of college, and you're still friends. I remember I have a girlfriend that I I, I could be done not talk to her in two years. She'll call me or I'll call her, and it's as if we never stop talking. We just talk about the kids, work, you know, all these different things. And it's like, the community, it's like we just pick up. You just kind of pick up where you left off. And it's like that relationship, you never lost the value of that relationship. I never thought about it with that word longevity, but you I think you nailed it. You're right. It it can pick up as if as if it was yesterday when there's when there's that real relationship going. Wow. I, I was thinking myself, what are some of the benefits that I feel uh, from long-term relationships? And I, I love your word longevity. I also think for me, it's a sense of safety. I know that that um, I know that there is there is support there. If I, as you said, if if I called you and asked for something, you'd be there. And and I think there's. That, that's the sense I have, that safety. 
Uh, I think there's another one. And certainly this is one that spans certainly my husband, but also some of my really close friends. There's a sense of acceptance that, that uh, you know, they have, they have seen who I am. They know who I am. And yet it's okay. That's so true. Let me ask you something though, Madeline. Sure. Teamwork. Mm -hmm. Do you think that play an important part of relationship? Building a team. Well, I can tell you that when I have built teams, and I've built a lot of them, uh, between managing a division and, and since being in my company, I've probably had 600 projects and often with team. The team doesn't function without there being some level of trust among the members that you will do what you say you're going to do so that I can do what I, I'm supposed to do. Um, and that does, that not only builds on relationships, it, it actually builds them because you have over time, coming back to that word time, you see the evidence that they are, they are there. Does that answer your question? Yes, fully. Because I sometimes think about when I'm working with teams, sometimes I ask myself, why did they choose to work with me on this team? And I actually, you know, why do you want to be here? Mm -hmm. You know, why do you want to work with this particular yeah. team? Or you want to work with this particular project? Yeah. You know, I've had um, young ladies to come to me and say, you know, they they left our team and they went and they came back. And I, I once asked this one particular girl, I said, why did you come back? She says, because I felt like family. Uh, and she said, I took a pay cut to come back because yeah. I felt like family. She yeah. says, and with me being near a military installation, my mom being somewhere else, my dad being somewhere else, I'm an only child. I needed that. I needed to feel accepted and yeah. I needed that family environment. Yeah. We, she needed we, a team yeah. of people around her yeah. to help nurture her and help develop her in those things that her goals. Yeah. Because as, as a team member, you always ask yourself, what are your goals? What do you want to do? You know, what kind of relationship do you want to get from this? Or you want to have, what kind of partnership do you want, to, you know, you want to create? I think mm -hmm. that's very important. Yeah. It's crucial. Well, I can't believe we've, <laughs> we're almost out of time. Wow. I know. I know. <laughs> it excites me to talk to you every time. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> but I, I, I want to ask you one more question. Okay. There are, a lot of career women watch this show. Actually, a lot of career men do watch this show too, but but I like to focus on the women today. What's the best strategy that you would say to, and I want to say keep their marriages going, because when you're in a career, as you mentioned earlier, there's your there's a competition. So what's your what what would be the best strategy? Hands down, date night. Hands down, date night. You have got, I, t I tell women with children, I said, look, those kids are going to grow up and they're going to be gone and they're going to have love lives and loves of their own. What are you going to do when they're 18 and 20 years old and you look over here and you don't even know this man no more, this woman, you don't even know him anymore because you didn't spend time with them. Anytime you don't spend time, you mm -hmm. grow apart. Yeah. So that time, that that Friday night, if you, if you don't do Friday nights, do Tuesday night, whatever, but be consistent. Let them know that they are valued, they're loved, and that you care. I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, I will. I'll say one, I'll add one thing to it. And I, I think you've hinted at it several times. That when you, you have a concern to sit down and talk about it. And just lay it out and and express how you feel, because I think feelings are something that we tend to suppress in our in our culture. And yet it's the feelings that are what's really hurting our bodies. So that would be my addition. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about that. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That 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 sitting down, talking to the other person, asking them, what do you want? Yeah. What do you desire? Yeah. I mean, it, and and you said it yourself. Your husband said, "What do you want?" And then and you and and it turns out. And then you said, "What do you want?" 
And, then and he so said, be present. I thought he was going to say something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you said I thought he was going to give me something more difficult. Yeah. You know, but I guess he felt like that was difficult because I was constantly running. I yeah. was constantly someplace, you know, either here or there. Yeah. I was just constantly running. Yeah. And when he said that, I stopped. Yeah. And it made me realize I'm not being present. I'm on the phone. Yeah. And, you know, I'm talking to somebody. I'm somewhere. I'm just doing something. I'm at work, writing, just doing something. Mm. Wow. Uh, I think I've learned some things today. And it doesn't matter yeah, how yeah. long you've, you've been in, in this lifetime, you can learn more. And yes, I, I just so appreciate your time with, with me on the show. Uh, I, I love it every time I learn. And it's, it's always feels very warm. Well, <laughs> like, thank you for inviting me. I, 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 I love spending time with you. But thank you. And I, I wonder if you have just some final words you want to share with our audience. Well, I'd like everybody to reach out and get my Dirty Dream book. You can go to LaFerris.com. Um, some of the things will take you on a roller coaster ride. Now, I'm just going to be honest. Um, also, follow me on all my links is LaFerris, uh, Risby at Facebook, LinkedIn. Every, you know, every social media uses my, my name. I was lucky enough to find it's my name. So um, just stay tuned. Stay tuned in your life. Build those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, check out my website if anybody needs, you know, any kind of coaching or if you're looking for a speaker. Um, I'm a certified family life educator, so I speak on a lot of different topics. Mm -hmm. But Madeline, just thank you for taking the time to invite me to your show. I've had a great time. Well, thank you, LaFaris. You are so generous uh, and generous with your heart. So thank you. Uh, it's always exciting to talk with LaFaris. But you know, before she joined us, you'll recall that I had just asked Dr. Ed his recommendation on how to build relationships with people. Now, he'll focus more on the business side, and the spoiler alert, he even talks about culture. But let's rejoin the conversation. That's right. Well, this gets to the, the importance of culture. You, you, you can't have learning. You can't have uh, high team performance. You can't have a relationship unless it's safe for me to be me and you to be you. And, and it's okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is what you know, Edmondson, you know, uh, termed uh, psychological safety. But it's been around a long time. It's the fact that if we're working in a family, if we're working in an organization or in a team, then we have to have the freedom to be honest, to say whatever we need to say, but it's still to be safe that we stay as part of, uh, as part of our, our team, part of our friendship. Hmm. Culture is very vital. And again, it's one of those intangibles organizations spend, how much time do they spend thinking about what's our culture going to be like? <laughs> when you start a, a project, do you spend any time talking to the team about, you know, what, how do we want to treat each other? You know, we, <clears throat> we don't do these things. Have you ever done that where you actually start a team and say, how do we want to treat each other? Oh, I usually do that. Yeah. I usually start one of two ways with that question or with gratitude or with appreciation. You know, sometimes I like to start with, let's just, we get into anything what do we appreciate about being here mm -hmm. and usually people look about what is this guy talking about but if you feel gra grateful and appreciative mm -hmm. then it calms you down and then you can get into things but the other way in terms of a team is yeah what is it that what do we want to do as a team how do we want to treat each other how do we want to work uh always will do that with the students you know when i'm teaching a little bit different but um you know what what do you expect how are we how do we work together? What kind of norms are we going to set up for how we, we work together? Uh, if I set a deadline for an assignment, if you miss that, how do you want me to treat it? Uh, yeah. how, you know, all these, these kinds of issues, I think. The more you establish that, the more we create an environment where we're in agreement of, of how we're going to be authentic in treating each other. You know, another aspect of that is that you feel more comfortable just knowing that this is the way you have decided it together. It's not that there are necessarily rules, but that you have right. agreed that this is how, so you have a, 
your whole, I think your sense of anxiety lowers if you know that this is right. okay. If I make a mistake or, or I do something crazy that, that I can anticipate something. Yeah. Cause we'd like to be, yeah. we'd like to feel we're in control and it's not and a it gives question. Us voice. Of, yeah. Right. It gives us, and it's one of the things we both come together in the story. It creates, we're creating our story as we, as we live, as we exist. So it's not looking back and telling a story of how we did things. You can also use the story to say, what's the story we want? What do we want to have at the end of this uh, this journey we have together? And how do we need to treat each other? And how are we going to, you know, yeah, I think very, these things are very powerful. And again, at schools, at universities, in degree programs, in MBAs, in organizations, they spend in most cases very little, if any, time on these things. Hmm. Yeah. Tell me, I mean, we have the audience out here. Uh, anybody, if, if you disagree with this notion, or if you think that organizations, university schools spend a lot or too much time on these things, send us a note. I'd love to track yeah. down that yes. person. But I, you know, be, you know, these things are so vital, but we don't prepare people. And, and I've mentioned this to you before. We don't really prepare men, certainly men of my generation. You're supposed to avoid emotions. You're supposed to avoid relationships. You were supposed you, to be in control. You were supposed control. to be in perfect control. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so. I remember. I remember those lessons. Yeah. That and then we I complain. Didn't... Yeah. <laughs> we no, complain I didn't about get control freaks. That's Why are they, you know, I, I would hear this all the time. How come these people are control freak? Because you <laughs> prepared them to be that way. You prepared them to be that way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> yeah. So if we want, if, if we want to begin to mold or create rather a culture where it is possible for people to really maintain relationships, uh, we have to think about actually being explicit about how we'll handle different right. kinds of situations so that and each we person have to commit has... learning right oh yes yeah. there's got to be resources that go into yeah. learning of these things and uh, yeah. you know how easy is it to get a a a, a, a course on uh, personal knowledge how easy is it to get a course on story how is easy i, I mean Mm -hmm. We both know how, to, you know, that's, you can sell a course on the uh, metaverse, which from everything I understand is going nowhere. Uh, you can sell, you know, you can build, you can get money for a database, which we've learned that lessons mm -hmm. don't get shared through databases, but right. uh, the things that we know are vital, but there's, these are scary things too. And so it's, maybe it's a transitional society, perhaps. <sighs> We were meant to live in relationship with others and long-term relationships teach us what it means to gain the remarkable benefits of such a relationship. We're happier, we're healthier, we're more productive. We begin to tap into the meaning of joy, that deep, deep feeling of satisfaction in who you are and what you are doing as we are warmed by the affection of others who know us well and accept and even affirm us in who we are. I want to thank you for joining me on this segment of Unlocked. I'm Madeline Blair, wishing you infinite possibilities as you unlock your resilience.